There is not an educated person on earth that does not recognize what lies in wait at the end of these railroad lines or who doesn't recognize this gate. Auschwitz, which became operational in 1940, is burned into our collective unconscious. But just beyond this puny, unmarked, unknown, unremembered little gate lies the Butovo shooting range. And here, beginning on August 8th of 1937, three years before Auschwitz, operations began at the world's first death camp. 91 people were shot in the back of the head that first day, kneeling in front of an open grave. From that day forward, there was hardly ever a day when fewer than 100 people were executed here. At its peak on February 28th of 1938, 562 individual human beings were executed here at Butovo, a place unknown to anyone who has not gone looking for it with persistence and determination. In his book, it was a long time ago and it never happened anyway. Historian David Satter tells of comrade A.V. Sadovsky, who had been the head of the administrative economic department of the NKVD, one of the direct successors to Iron Felix's Cheka and a direct antecedent to the KGB and the current FSB. Speaking of the beginning of the Great Terror in 1936, Sadovsky said, all of the execution chambers in Moscow were working at full capacity yet there were more and more people to shoot. It became difficult to remove the bodies of those who had been executed without being noticed by people in the area. There began to be bad rumors and the executioners, meanwhile, were pushed to the limit. What went on? What went on? There was no time to wash away the blood in the basements. There were brains on the walls, but people kept coming and it seemed like the shooting would never end. I did not know where to send the corpses. Everything was filled, everything. So Butovo not only became a mass grave, it became a killing field as well. Here's David Satter again. At first, the local people did not pay much attention to the shots from the Butovo firing range. They assumed that exercises were being conducted. Soon, however, an atmosphere of fear settled over the area. People on their way home were passed by black prison vans. They began to hear strange sounds. A muffled woman's voice shouted, don't do it, don't touch me, I have children. Sometimes there were distant screams. There was the singing of the Internationale interrupted by shots. Cars raced down neglected forest roads, sometimes a dozen at a time. People stopped speaking of their foreboding even to one another. Children were forbidden to walk past the firing range, which was surrounded by barbed wire. And all of that happened right here, right at this gate, right here. The buses from the Lubyanka and La Fortovo usually arrive between 1 and 2 a.m. The terrified, confused faces were checked against files containing their photographs. They then had their hands tied behind their backs, were read their sentences, and were led to the edge of a pit. Now, in the early days, these pits had been made by a small bulldozer, but before long, giant excavators would be called in. The executioners had been waiting in a small stone house where they had been given their daily barrel of vodka and invited to drink as much as they liked. This was not particularly difficult work and at point blank range, even an unsteady hand would still do the job. The victims were forced to their knees, shot in the back of the head and then kicked into the ditch while more screaming or crying or stoic or uncomprehending men and women were brought forward one of those people was Mikhail Shimonin, seen here. He was 13 years old when he was shot in the back of the head, right here in this open field that looks no different today than any park or open field that you and I have ever stood in. But then again, Moscow is not an American city. In addition to Mikhail Shimonin, we have the names of an additional 20,760 people who lie buried beneath this small patch of ground. Some estimates run to 60 a still relatively new President Vladimir Putin came to the site in 2007 to mark the 70th anniversary of the world's first extermination center. In his remarks, he attributed these deaths and the 20 million others murdered by their own government during the Soviet era as being attributable to, quote, excesses of the political conflict, unquote. And so proving that while you can take the man out of the secret police, 
you can't take the secret police out of the man. So when we say that something like 100,000 people were murdered in Moscow alone during a half century of terror, does it help for me to say that that number, 100,000 people, is Burbank, California? That it's Lansing, Michigan? That it's Springfield, Illinois? It's the entire population of Tuscaloosa, Alabama, or Boulder, Colorado, or Green Bay, or every man, woman, and child in Provo, Utah, or South Bend, Indiana, all of those bodies, all of those people, just in that one city alone, does that help? Or is the magnitude of the murder simply too big to grasp? I'm Bill Whittle, and this is an Empire of Terror.